But if we don't think it is, then what makes people think that controlling movement into the country will solve what problems? You know, what will what does immigration control solve? And I think that that's the question that we have to ask, or what do people think it solves, if we want to engage the population in the conversation around, uh, to my mind, the bluff that the government pulls on immigration control. And so if I, if I start with that, you know, in identifying what is, what is immigration control protecting people from? And who is it protecting? And there are a number of things that people will say. Uh, the first one in the big international scale is that everybody needs immigration control, including us, to protect us from international terrorists. It's emigration control we would need if the world was to be protected from violence and, and, and terror. Right, can we... Is there a seat? Or do you have to stand? Can, is there a spare seat this gentleman could have that might be? Yes. Uh -huh. so, that, so that's our first question, is why are people obsessed with controlling immigration? And what are the contradictions around it? If you look, for example, at the number of people who leave this country, north or south, to go and work somewhere else, if we're arguing for immigration controls, should we not have some form of immigration control? You know, I don't think we should have either. But the logic of controlling the movement into the country on the basis of the collective economic well-being of the country also stands good for emigrating. So when lots of our young students, when lots of young people in whose education we have invested, when lots of people who have a good education and good qualifications leave the country, should we not stop them from going? Should we not say, excuse me, you're not allowed to leave the country until you pay back to the public purse some of the investment in the public purse that was given to you because you're taking it away to use it somewhere else? There'd be some row. <laughs> There's some row if as well as failing to provide employment opportunity for our citizens, we charge them for the insult on the way out. But it makes economic sense if that is the logical argument we're making about controlling people coming in. That people coming in are a burden on the economy, are a burden on the services, then surely the investment we make on the people going out should be repaid because they are going to get the benefits of wages from their professions that we educated them to achieve but we are not getting the benefit of our investment back in. We could also ask the question why is it that if the majority of the populist opinion in Ireland and in the UK is that immigration needs to be controlled. Why do we think that we are such an asset to the rest of the world? So why is it when we ship off to Australia, when we ship off to America, the dynamic of the conversation changes? It's not about us going, taking some poor Australian's job. Not at all. We're improving. We're improving the place. God, America wouldn't be what it is today had it not been for us. We built Australia. There wouldn't be a railway working in England. We built them all. This is our narrative, that we leave our country, and in leaving it, we have enriched every society to which we have gone. So is the logic, therefore, not <clears throat> that people then coming to our society would also bring that diversity, that new skill, that new dynamic and perspective 
that would enrich our society. So what I'm basically saying is we are in the middle around immigration. We are involved in an irrational conversation. And we have a number of irrational conversations in the country. Uh, conversations around abortion are also irrational. Uh, and when I say that, I don't mean people disagree with my opinions. I mean the core conversation, no matter what side you're on, is not based on logic or reason or evidence. These are deeply held emotional conversations. So how did we get so emotional about immigration? Does anybody in the room know what our biggest illegal immigrant problem looks like? Who are the biggest number of people who, if we take a hard line and say tomorrow, what we have to do first of all is get rid of the illegals. Don't want any illegality around this country. So the first thing we're going to do is we're all going to agree that the illegals need their doors kicked in tomorrow, need hogged down, put on the plane and shipped home. What does, the, what does that look like? Who do you think is going to get their door knocked in tomorrow? What colour is it? Can you see them? Can you see the gender? Can you see the national origin? Can you see the colour of the person that's going? Anybody want to guess what they look like? Any, yeah? Black man, Nigerian. No. The single, yeah? Hedgehog I, manager. I guess American. Overstay. You're or uh, British. Yeah. Right. right. In the south of Ireland, American. The British get a bite as we get one over there. That's not a real logicality. In the south of Ireland, the predominant group are young, white, English speaking Americans. Hot on their heels are Australians. Young, white Australians. In the north of Ireland, the balance is a bit the other way round because the UK factor is that Australians are the single biggest group in, and uh, a bit behind them are the Americans. So if we got rid of all the illegal immigrants on this island, the people that would be on the bus to the airport tomorrow morning are yuppie yanks and wandering Australians. And that's exactly what they're doing here. They came in on, on a young under 30 professional visa and forgot to go home. Mm -hmm. They come in on the six month visit to visit the granny. They forget to go home. How come we don't see them? Because they look like, you know, what's that, what is that cartoon? I want to walk like you, talk like you. So ditch the accent <coughs> and they, they, they hide. Ditch the accent and they hide. So it's an illogical conversation. The, the conversation leads us to think that the problem, whatever it is with immigration, is created by the country being overwhelmed by Africans seeking political asylum. No, it's not. No, it's not. The majority of people coming into the country as immigrants, not counting the people who come and, and forget to do their documentation and go home, who are predominantly white, the majority of people coming into the country to find work are coming in from the European Union. And technically that's not immigration. That's another irrational conversation. You love the European Union. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Any EU money. ESF, ERDF, E anything. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Farmers money. I love that. Capital spend. I love that. People. We won't have any of them. Thank you. So we have another irrational conversation about are we in Europe or are we out of Europe? So we try to rationalize it. The issue about immigration and the conversation about immigration is a false conversation avoiding a real conversation. 
And the real conversation is about racism. The real conversation is about, do we want people who look different to us? Do we want black people? Do we want brown people? Do we want Chinese people coming in here, into our country, taking our jobs? Mm. Not taking your jobs. You know, the bank took, you, took the people's jobs and they said, all right, you know, what we do best, yeah. Would you want two jobs? You're taking my money, didn't take enough. That's a populist Ireland. Can't get them off their asses to fight for their jobs. Can't get them off their asses to, to take on the government. But everybody wants to pick on the immigrant who's stealing their job. So we have to have real conversations deconstructing the questions about what is, the, what is the relationship between inward migration and unemployment. Migration is actually keeping the unemployment figures from being worse. The people coming into the country, country contribute to the country. That, uh, I think Manus will take up more, more, of, more of that in, in detail. But the real issue that we are looking at is what is it about the way we think that is at best fearful and at worst downright hostile about the inward migration to this country of people of different colour, of different nationality, of different language? And whenever you strip it all away, the harsh reality is that our history and construction of society is racial. We might like to get the violin out and the fiddle out and play the we are the oppressed. We stood the line of oppression against the empire with the rest. <laughs> but we are part of white English speaking Western Europe. And as white English speaking Western Europe, we are in a privileged position in relation to people who are not part of that mainstream, dominant, imperialist culture. And our thinking, our thinking is clouded by that history. Add to it our history of Catholic missions. And what we have is a belief that if our racism is patronizing, then it's not as bad as everybody else's. But the reality is that the immigration question can only be taken on as part of a question on deconstructing racism so that we can eradicate it. And there's a, a, a campaign starting across the UK to end racism in this generation. And the best thing we could do on this very small island, north and south, is commit ourselves to end racism in this generation. And if we did, you would never hear immigration controls mentioned again. Thank you. Sure, that would be all clear, right? I'm very sorry for taking your homes, <laughs> taking your suitcases, holding your sort of hostels with pregnant women and taking your jobs and reducing your wages. So if that's your perception, that's what I am doing. First of all, I'm sorry, let's be friends because we have a serious problem to tackle, right? So, and this is the man who actually introduced the sort of, these sort of concepts. Remember the referendum of 2004, Matthew, where the bloody hell is he now, I wonder. But at the same time, I'm not bloody sorry for thousands of empty homes, 300,000, Richard Boyvard told us yesterday, isn't that correct? Uh, thousands of teaching jobs lost, therefore your children are actually uh, in ever increased classroom sizes. Uh, hospital closures, where my uh, four-year-old daughter will uh, get a speech therapist uh, after a waiting list of 36 months, right? Uh, thousands of workers being fired. And I'm also not bloody sorry for the facts and figures that we are faced to deal with today, right? And I think it's very important as anti-racist campaigners, as uh, civilized people, as decent people to know these facts and figures, not to get bogged down with all of them all the time, but to know, understand all of these things, right? So I'm going to drill a little bit into 
unemployment and, and immigration, because we tend to talk about this in that context, because there's unemployment and there's an, an, the issue of migrants in this country, right? So, I mean, I suppose one question I'm going to pose is actually, do immigrants cause unemployment and low wages? So you might as well ask, do, East, do Eastern European drivers cause more accidents? Do Muslims cause terror? Do travelers cause crime? Do women call, uh, lower the wages? By the way, that's what we were told for years and years. Remember, women cause lower wages because the bosses would pay women less. Right? Do, do workers cause the bank crash? And mm -hmm. uh, would we have uh, higher wages, more jobs if immigrants, they all bloody went home? And uh, does the system really ba work based on nationality, gender, ethnicity, race, religion, or does it really work based on those three symbols there? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. how does the system really work, right? So, I think we need to understand all of these things and we need to sort of discuss them a little bit, right? So. Uh, we didn't have a good autumn actually this, 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 in Europe and in Ireland, and I'd like to briefly mention about a few of these things. First of all, we had the disaster, the terror of Lampedusa. 300 migrants died at sea, mm -hmm. and they died a needless death, because Europe said, we are not going to allow you to come to Europe through normal, humane procedures. They died at sea, right? 300, most of them are still children, right? Then we had the incident of the state attacking the Roma people, along with the media, along with the, with the state agencies, and that showed us the sort of in, inherent racist nature of the state, right? When it came to the other, to the different, uh, the, the different people. I mean, last week or the week before, we saw the Tala incident, where actually a, a Muslim family's shop was attacked, and they wrote all sorts of hor horrible things uh, onto, the, onto the shop walls, right? Oh, Mr. Blunkett of Britain has suddenly discovered that if there are many more of these Roman gypsies arriving to Britain, there'll be riots. Does he warn the society that there will be riots, or does he want the society to get up and riot, right? Where is that influx of Roma people? How many are we talking about? What are the numbers? Where are they coming from? Whose jobs are they taking? What services have they been, have they been caught? What schools have they, not, have they been given and they have refused to attend? What sort of social services have they refused to take that, that actually there will be riots, right? So there he comes. Ryanair boss. Oleri, very happy to hire cheap labor from anywhere in the world. Very happy to hire the sort of the croppiest airports, uh, uh, airports around, the, around the Europe, staffing it with very low page people. Said the Muslims do not integrate. We should, we should get rid of the Muslims, get banned by them, right? So, and shows you the capitalists are very much interested in this whole of debate, aren't they? Sort of in many ways and many forms, right? And then, and then of course, as we speak today, even today, folks, IFSC. Millions and billions of euro worth of transactions are coming in and out of the, this country, flying from here to China, from China to Hong Kong, from Cayman Island to Ireland, back to Ireland, U US, vice versa, and there's no bloody control. Do we control that money? Do we know? I mean, any investor can go anytime at, during the day, invest in any stock market anywhere in the world, and there's no bloody control. We can't even bloody tax the thing, right? So, even a little tax, right? And then, of course, the, the fact that do we need immigration control? It's sort of posing the question in a way that as if there is no control. There is bloody control. There has always been immigration control, at times relaxed, at times quite uh, sort of, sort of uh, strengthened, but there has always been immigration control. There has been immigration control since the nation states have been established, right? Since Italy we know as today is Italy, uh, before it, well, it wasn't like this today. I mean, Italy hasn't been just the very same borders all along, but since the Germany is Germany, as we know, there has been immigration control. But why is this debate then coming all again and again? I'm 15 years in this country, right? Why is this debate coming? Why am I speaking on this for uh, years? Can we actually get enough, ra you know, racism and, and, and such things within the confines of the, of, the, of, the, of the system we live in, right? It's one of the most debated subjects. And it's always linked to crisis. It's always linked to crisis. It always becomes a nice subject to microwave, throw out to the open, and then start dividing and conquering people in trade unions, in schools, on the streets, and whatever, right? So it's also based on lies and perceptions. It is, and I will prove you in a, in a minute. I have a laptop computer that will enable me to prove you the lies and, lies and perceptions, right? And there are two reasons, by the way, why, why immigration happens, or emigration happens. They make people unemployed. People say, we are not leaving the country. We want jobs here, we want schools here, but they say, no, we have no jobs for you. If you like, there's a job in Canada, you know, uh, or, or somewhere else. So I agree with your point, absolutely. You are talking about immigration control. Let's make sure you don't force people to immigrate either. It's because of wars, because of global warming, and because of bloody globalization. You know, you sell your fridge around the world. Your music travels around the world. Your ads go around the world. It's, you, say, tell, you tell us all the time it's a glo uh, global village. 
That's why we have immigration, first of all, right? And also people follow the money, people follow an employment, people follow different, la different life, people follow a better life at times, right? And the other reason we talk about immigration control is, is because the bloody ruling classes are always bringing it up onto the, onto the discussion platform, aren't they? It's always the ruling classes that brings it up. My neighbor, who's an ordinary worker like myself, never thinks about immigration control on a daily basis, unless you open the paper, migrants take on school places. And she's been waiting for a school place for three years. Oops, yeah, yes, of course, you know, so, because they bring it. And why do they bring it? Why do they, why do they want us to discuss all of these things? Because it's a good way of controlling, it's a good way, way of dividing people, isn't it? What do they say? It's a problem, immigration is always a problem. We are, there are too many of us, or of you sometimes when you go to, North, go to Australia. It needs to be controlled, they take your jobs, hospitals, blah, 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 blah. There are alien culture, there's crime when migrants uh, exist. And, 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 and they have different food, different clothing, they smell different, they eat different, they talk even in the bosses different, right? <laughs> so so you know, all of these things are, uh, are happening, right? But what do we do? I, I make no apology. I fight immigration control, I fight racism, I'm a socialist. And I believe we need to start attacking the issue, discussing the issue in a rather deep political sense and understand where it comes from. And I understand in my socialist view that this racism and immigration control is an inherent problem generated by the system we live under. Divide and conquer system, system of exploitation, system of uncontrolled transactions of money and wealth, but in return, system that actually operates based on attacking workers, dividing workers, putting bloody borders in place, right? I'm just going to show you a few slides, just a little bit of slides, right? Get rid of these myths. We have already spoken about them. There's plenty of them. Oh yeah, or is that migrant social welfare system. When was the lowest unemployment rate in Ireland? This is a table I compiled from ILO, International Labour Organization, Irish Times, uh, CSO, and various other agencies. The lowest unemployment in Ireland was 4.4, right? And that was the highest time of migrants coming to this country. Mary Harney was on the phone talking to Turkish counterparts, I'm from Turkey, saying, we need 500 more, thousand more of you, right? We, they need 500 more of me in this country, right? But what was happening during that time? You see that, that column, investment percentage. This is a percentage that basically the capitalist classes of this country have reinvested into factories, machineries, software, hardware, and sh jobs. So look what happens. 23, 27, 28, 26, 21. Oops, 15, 16. And seemingly it's almost single digit now. And look what happens, immigration, unemployment wise. 6.4, 11.8, 13.6, and then bang, 14 and onwards, and then it becomes a serious crisis, right? What happens during the same time? The migrant workers, 5.5% goes up to 10%, there is the lowest unemployment rate in the country at that time, and now there are actually 40% less migrants in the country, or work permit holders, or whatever you call it, right? So all those groups of people, right? So one has to understand, it is not the migrant workers who actually take all those jobs, etc., uh, uh, places in schools, hospitals, it is the lack of those things. I mean, they say, oh, there's a job, but two people apply to it, one migrant, one non-migrant, right? One local. If the migrant wasn't here, the local would bloody get the job. No, that's a lie. For every job, there are 26 applicants. 10% of the society are migrants. Take the 10% out, you still have to compete against 24 people. That's the bottom line. So you may have a marginal increase, 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 increase uh, ratio there, but that's where we are, by the way, talking about cleaning the streets to brain surgery. Whichever one you like, choose, pick, whatever, right? So, the other thing we need to also talk about as well. Immigration and immigration control. Where do you bloody want to start? Which arrow do you want to reverse? Which migrants in the world do you want to send back home? Shall we send the Irish back from uh, uh, America and uh, Australia back to Ireland? Or should the Turks go back home? Or maybe all non-Native Americans should return to wherever they came from, right? So, this is the history since the 17th century. A bit of research I did, right? of people migrating. I'll tell you something, get used to it. It's not going to change. It's not going to change. What's going to happen is actually there will be lines between these arrows, border controls, armies, this, that, that, that will actually tell us mentally as if there has to be control around it because through that control they can actually implement any, any, any sort of thing they want on us, right? So what do we need to do that? The other thing we need to understand is that population growth in a country is a bad thing. Can it be a bad thing? I mean, how come that from since year that the population of the Earth is growing, so is technology, so is, so is life expectancy, so is sort of all control of the environment. Okay, we destroy it, destroy it as well, but you know, so 
can we say that we have a better life standard in general, better access to services in general? I mean, I'm not actually, by the way, appraising the system we are living under, but, you know, think about the progress mankind made. I mean, we can't dismiss these things, right? So population growth, surely if it was something that caused unemployment, that caused all sorts of things, surely we would have you know, more and more misery. But how come in 1950s in Britain and Germany, there was huge population increase, the economy was growing, and there was little unemployment? And how come in the 80s suddenly there was huge drop in, uh, in migrant numbers, but there was huge uh, unemployment, right? So the other thing I need to understand, I need, I need to put it out there, and you, you put it out there very well, but I think anti-migration policies, migration control has to be taken in the context of racism because it ignores all of the above, ignores all the facts and figures, deals with an issue of the ruling classes to divide the conquer the society through myths and mysteries. And racism is organized, racism is pumped into society, it's injected into the society, and it has to be fought in that context. Shall we not debate on migration control? Of course we can debate, we should debate, but we should debate, I think, in that context, not in the context of let's have immigration control, because I bet every one of you will be affected by that one way or the other, right? So, the bosses play, of course, a double game. What do they do? Remember the, 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 the Irish ferry situation. They bloody fired the Irish workers, unionized workers, hired migrant workers. But look, look what happened. 100,000 people went onto the streets in this country, Irish and non-Irish, fought for the rights of the workers, migrant and, and uh, uh, local alike, right? So the bosses on one hand are very happy to exploit workers anywhere in the world, right? Pay 30 cents per, per, per week or per day to a Bangladeshi worker, or bring them over if they need them over. But on the other hand, they'll be part of that sort of elite capitalist structure that will throw this debate out onto the open, right? That we need to control migrants. Because why do they do that? Hey, if we get organized in workplaces and fight for uh, salary increases and this and that, and if we tell our bosses to, to, uh, uh, you know, to create more jobs, if you fight with the government, if you fight with the establishment, it is great isn't it, that they can say it's actually her, not me. What am I is this? What am I is that, basically, right? So that's the, that's the sort of whole logic behind it. I mean, that's the sort of whole structure behind it, right? So I think... What we are facing in Ireland today is, is serious, and I think at this stage anyone would laugh at, at us if we suggested that the migrants have caused any of the issues that we, we, we are experiencing at the moment, right? Now, the other thing that all migrants are doing, I'm a trade unionist. I have a local branch in which I fight for workers' rights. So are many migrants, right? Here's another thing, which is sort of also important, because it's their bloody lies that we need to counteract as well. You mentioned about, you know, uh, uh, input to the economy. You know how much migrant workers contributed to the economy before, before the crash in 2008? During, actually, in the early stage of the crash. 3.7 million, billion. That was the input of the migrant shops into the economy, right? So, as if that migrants suck the social welfare, as if that migrants are always a problem, is a bloody lie. And as Bernard had very, very nicely explained, when we talk about migrants, we don't talk. We don't talk about blonde, blue-eyed, you know, European person. We sort of have the tendency of thinking because that's what they're throwing at us. Images, millions of them every day. Irish Times, Irish Independent, Irish Sun, whatever. You know, page three, page ten. They throw at us this picture of of of, of this problem of, of a migrant. But there is no problem. I think the only problem is the bloody system that actually has attacked cancer patients, youth alike, students alike, teachers alike. Right? It's the bloody system, and it is inherent, I, I would argue, that in the, in, the, in the capitalist state, for the purpose of profit-making, racism, immigration control, hand-in-hand, hand, go together. And these bloody states, by the way, displace 5 million people in Afghanistan, kill 1.5 million people in Iraq, right? They support dictators, they sell to the Turkish government, for example, hundreds of thousands of tear gas canisters, and then people run away from those conditions of war, terror, torture, <coughs> inhumane life, or, or poverty, bottom line, they then start talking about migration control. And we find ourselves yet again, people who are causing the problem are also people who are actually saying that there's a problem and they want us to obey their solutions and follow their, their lead or their ideology in terms of addressing the problem. I don't think we will do that because we as socialists, we also believe everyone is welcome here, and everyone alike, uh, uh, migrants and, uh, and local alike, will have to fight the state. Therefore, I think we need to join the Socialist Workers' Party and fight against the system. Okay, thank you for, to our speakers. A lot of issues.
issues have come up there and I'm sure people have some comments to make and I'd also encourage people, if you just have a question, it's okay to ask a question as well and I would encourage people who are making comments to limit yourself to two, three minutes maximum and otherwise I, if you go over that I will ask you to finish because there's a lot of people in the room and I'd like to hear from as many people as possible. So if you'd like to say something, put your hand up and I'll take a few at a time and then ask the speakers. because it, it's my, and I don't think I've moved, I think I do the same work mm -hmm. I've always done. Mm -hmm. It's the context that has widened. But I, I keep doing the same thing. Just that the nature and diversity of the people with whom I work uh, changes. Mm -hmm. But my, my, I think we have to fight it, you know, uh, we're talking about as socialists. We have to fight it wherever it is very strategically, you know, at all levels. I think at the personal level, where you're talking about children uh, and, and you're talking about parents in the school situation, you're talking about people in a social situation. Human beings, by and large, you know, and we, we saw that in the North. I look to John, because I see John from, from the North as well. We used to hear people in the North say, would kill you, but he's a very decent soul. <laughs> And, and that might sound odd, but that's true. Everybody hates the person they don't know. They know the, they know the migrant who come and took the jobs. But it's not Harry that lives next door they've got to know. He managed to fix their boiler when it didn't work. So at a very personal level, I think we do have to challenge. We have to be know how to do it. And if that requires us to learn how to do it, we should never allow the racist myth to go unchallenged. It doesn't mean that you have to get your soapbox out and hit people over the head with it or insult them or whatever. But in whatever small way, it was the same when we when we tackled, you know, when we had to take on anti feminist, anti women language. You have to you have to challenge it wherever it is. You have to ask people to to explain themselves and bearing in mind that every day I see it, uh, every, every single day in my work, in, in, the, in the north, whatever, you know, and people sometimes look across the border and say, at least you have a welfare state, ha ha. Mm -hmm. There is legislation in the United Kingdom which actually says that no woman with children should be allowed to be unhoused, on the street, in the hours of darkness. That's fundamental legislation. But now, that le legislation has a caveat, which says, unless they have no entitlement to public resources. <coughs> so the people who are allowed to be left on the street, vulnerable, are, are immigrant women, the most vulnerable of women and children, immigrant women and, and immigrant children can be left on the street. And what happens when that happens? The welfare of the child is paramount. That's the next piece of legislation. So the state comes and takes the children of the parent because the parent is on the street with the child because, because no benefit. You know, this myth that, that people are coming, taking our benefits and filling our maternity wards and getting our child benefit. What is actually happening is that women and children are coming uh, to Dungannon, coming to Lisburn, coming to Belfast, coming to London, and having their children put in care for no reason other than they're poor. These are not bad parents, these are not negligent parents. If children understood the precarious nature of the lives of other children, and we're taught solidarity. I think that's the bit that's the bit that we're missing uh, in in the one-to-one -one human action. Yes, we need to organise in the trade union movement. We need to organise around labour because if if the employers could wring the labour out of the human being and leave the human being at the border and take the labour in, that's what they would do. If they actually could squeeze the labour out of you and leave your body and soul at, at, the, at border control, they would do it. But men, women and children 
making decent lives for themselves in new countries is our history. Which part of us doesn't get the payback? Which part of us doesn't get the solidarity for people who then, as we have come up in the world, we think, that we are not required by human solidarity to open our doors. If we had no immigration control, if people could go wherever they liked, I keep asking the question, what would possess a citizen of Guinea-Bissau to wake up in Guinea-Bissau some morning and say, Dumb Gannon, here I come. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what happens. Nobody wakes up in Turkey and says, you know what? My life's unfulfilled. Down the teacher's club of a Sunday afternoon the social workers party. That's the life for me. You know, life takes us where it takes us. It just takes us where it takes us. So who what's all you know, what's all this about if it's not about what what you're saying? If it's not about dehumanizing human beings and extracting labor from them and doing that in the most cost-effective way by dehumanizing them and dehumanizing us. So in schools, I think it is about, it is about being strategic uh, and just, just to come in on that, I think not only can it be one, but I think it's one of the big, cracking it is one of the big turning points. If we can understand why we, why our thinking is racially constructed, mm. which it is, mm. once we begin to understand how our thinking has been constructed <coughs> here and how that is impacted everywhere else, then we get imperialism and capitalism. Then we get it. You know, it doesn't have to be a big argument. It's not just, you know, the historic. You know, once you get racism, you have to revisit the entire history of the world. You just have to revisit it. You know that bit about Christopher Columbus discovering America? A lie. It was always there. He was, a, he was an illegal immigrant. You know, you don't ever, I never hear anybody. I never, I, I'm, I'm, working since, I'm working since 2001 giving basic immigration advice and nobody ever said, I've just arrived, where do I stick my flag and claim ownership of them? Yeah. <laughs> I've just arrived, it must be mine, I haven't seen it before. <laughs> so why do we think Christopher Columbus discovered America? And what did we go when we were finished plowing the rocks of Bond? We went and made Australia what it was, what it is today. Not a word. And then we helped, you know, and we sent money out, sent money out to Africa for the black babies. That was a queer help. So let's revisit that. That's what, you know, if if people came here and said we're on a mission to civilize Dublin, and, and first of all, there's a lot of that superstitious Catholicism about it. we have a superior religion, and you would all need to be taken it up, or else, and uh, we'd need to change your history. Then you would have some conversation about immigration control, but that is what people did. That's what people did. That's what people did. People went out to other people's countries. They pillaged and looted and stole. And then we go to the museum and look at what we stole from other people. Now, if you understood racism, you, that whole history, as history as we understand it, would begin to crumble. And then understanding why we all were educated in that light would become easier to understand. So the battle against racist thinking is not some add-on. The battle against imperialist thinking is not some add-on to the battle for socialism. They're integral parts of, of making, making that logical argument. And sometimes, you know, you have to make it 
simple. And sometimes you just have to get the union organised. But, you know, you have to do a wee bit every day. And I think that is that is about some of us. We all have to be doing something every day. And the one thing, you know, we have a saying in, in, in Dungannon where we're working. And people say Dungannon must be the racist capital of Ireland because it has the highest rate of reported racism. We say we don't know if, it, if there's more racism in Dungannon or not. But what we do know is there's less chance in Dungannon of anybody getting away with it than anywhere else we know. <laughs> no, there's not. There's nothing wrong. And uh, you know, if you say, look, that makes that makes a bit of common sense. When you start off, you make it sounds right. You say, look, let's just let's just accept everybody that is that is here. Yeah. But then, if that's what you're saying, then I'm saying then you need to keep everybody that's here here. We can't be giving people jobs and then them hopping off to America. You know, well, we could do fine. You know, we know who's going out. We know who's coming in, and we can. But go. but you can't you can't have it both ways. You can't say let's work with what we've got here, as if this was a static. You know, as if there was a fixed population, because this population will change. People who are here will want to go. So what will we say then? Will we say right? You know, the same as the hospital queue. You two can't come in to these two go. It, it's it's illogical to say, you know, let's look at what's here because the population here is always shifting. We have free movement, so people will go out from here. And when people go out from here, who will do any work? You know, there's a labour question first, but I tend there are two aspect, aspects I look at it. Human beings have been migrating since they were invented. That's a reality. They've been, you know, that's how we got here. I actually, Ireland, the one good thing that I don't know if you know this, this is a different train of thought. Do you know that Ireland is one of the few nations in the world that has no creation mythology? At least we don't delude ourselves. Ah, that we were made here. We got here. We, you know, this island on, is the last stop before America, and in the movement across Europe, we ended up here. So we're all immigrants. We're all immigrants. We keep on moving. People just have a right. There's a thing about free movement. The world belongs to all of us and we have a right to move around it. The limitation of our movement has been created for specific purposes. And we say, who created those purposes? And the rules change, and that's what I'm saying. That, you know, there was no question about immigration control or emigration control when we were stealing what other people had. Your position may sound sensible and an honest position held by yourself that the government would do well to look after the people who are already here. Yes, it should, but that is no bearing on the freedom of movement to come in and out of here. Yes, the government should do what you're saying. And if it did, if it did do that, then, as, as, as you have said, Manus, the, if it invested, then the economy would grow. And in fact, immigration would, immigration would increase. Because if they did invest, there would be more work to do, more people would come, and the country would get stronger. Okay. okay, I think what I want to do, and I come back to just answer the questions that you raised, I think that, that uh, rather than go over everything else. Uh, and in that context, in fact, uh, I only got in this afternoon to, to, to do this meeting, because I've been at a conference in, in Leicester, which was debating exactly that. There were 600 of us at a conference in Leicester debating the, and discussing the, the independence of social justice movements and social movements uh, in the context in which communities and community organising and the community sector has, uh, to a degree, been co-opted by funding 
into the government agenda. And there are tensions around all of that relationship. The organisation uh, in which I work and of which I was a founder and member, I volunteered in it for about three years and then I, I got paid employment in my late 50s. Uh, I'm, I'm what they call a woman returner <laughs> to the labour market. Uh, it is, it's not unique, it's a kind of different organisation. And it was interesting at this conference how many of us there are growing up. The, uh, and, uh, and again, this is something that John, uh, coming from the North again, being involved in that, is, is about collective community action. We have always set from we put the group together in 1996, never to allow uh, our organisation to be 100% funded and to aim for less than 50% of public funds keeping the organisation. And at the minute, we... we uh, actually get less than 50% of our funding from the government. We get about 40% from the government. We get about 30% from uh, private philanthropy and, uh, and basically raising funds and stuff like that. And we earn, you know, we earn the rest as a business earning, collect, er, collectively earning income. And that gives us a degree of independence because it's very clear that uh, the government is pulling back funding and is pulling back funding most on the people who use the funding and criticize the government and therefore it's silencing and pushing and coercing uh, and that's a big discussion i think has to be had within the community organizations to what degree are we now agents of social change and it's a it's a an argument that socialists have to take up in the community context as well, because there is a sense in the communities that the socialist, uh, you know, the ideological socialist organisations take a kind of socialist good community yuck. But actually, the real people that you have to win into political organisations are halfway there if they're organised in solidarity and social movements. So I think that's a big challenge for organisations like the Socialist Workers' Party and movements like People Before Profit and other solidarity campaigns, I think, are, are very important in doing that. But there is a, there is a crisis in, in community organisations. Uh, and, and I think in closing, there is something, you know, that we have the biggest myth. We have to keep challenging it. There is no shortage of resources. That's the first myth, that there's a shortage of resources. There's not. The country is not poor. We are poor. The government is poor because it's allowing the wealthy not to put their money into the public kitty. It's allowing the wealthy not to pay their fair share of taxes. It's allowing a taxation system that takes money off the everyday, ordinary, working people. It's not that there aren't any resources. There are no bankrupt bondholders. There are no bankrupt bankers. We were looking just there, uh, Flyby, as Flyby. We call it, it matters to us because they're probably at the end of the day going to pull out of Belfast City Airport and we'll have to walk again. But Flyby are laying off workers at the same time that they announced they went out of the red and into the black this year and their profit this year was 400 billion or million. I just, my, my eyes go funny when I see more than 10 knots. But how could they be poor and make that degree of profit? We're not poor. We're not poor. Uh, so that's, you know, I think those are the myths I would like in finishing to say. We are not poor. We are being robbed. Immigration is not causing our problems, and if we can face up to and challenge racism, you'd be surprised how educated we would become. The important thing here to understand is uh, people aren't genetically or inherently racist, because if that was the case, the world as we know today would not exist and it will be like we'll be fighting wars all over the place.
will be killing each other. So we are not inherently racist, as Ben and Brenda said. The construction of racist ideas in our heads is coming from our objective surroundings, in a sense, from our lives, from our miseries, from our, or whatever. Right? I think that's very important. Uh, and Leah is right, yes, we can actually fight against racism, but I think that fight is, in a sense, will have to go hand in hand with the fight against the existing system, which actually causes the misery, right? It's not a nice to have an extension of it, it's an essential part of it. I think women's rights, migrants' rights, anti-racism fights are very essential part of a fight in changing the system, right? I think they are part of that engine, basically. And, and the important thing, I think, to understand is each time we actually, uh, we actually inflict a blow to the system, we also gain, make significant gains. And racism is not something that we need to wait until, until, until situations like in Greece happen. We have to fight it now, here, and everywhere we are, right? I think that's important. But the important thing also as well is, uh, it's not a moral issue. It's not a moral issue of some, 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 some nasty person having nasty thoughts about migrants uh, or, 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 or black people or whatever. It's an issue of having to deal with the surroundings, the objective conditions of people, and show people that by changing these objective conditions, like if someone loses their jobs, and they can get a job, and their bank, bank managers are onto them every second day, and they, 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 their children are, are, are not getting proper school places, and they're depressed, their family is depressed, and their son and daughter is thinking of emigrating, uh, etc., then these are the objective conditions that makes these people go into fear, depression, anger, anxiety, and then the racists, the organized racists, like Golden Dawn, who are under the soil, under the ground, waiting to come up, are feeding off that, off that, off that fear, of that hatred, right? And each time a government minister shamelessly says we should bribe migrants to go home, someone gets attacked on the street. Each time Mr. Blunkett says there will be riots on the streets, there will be goddamn riots. Thank you, EDNs uh, have, have broken into million pieces, but there will be riots. So, hardcore racism doesn't feed from sort of uh, hardcore racist campaign day to day on the streets. Hardcore racism actually feeds, gets his energy, gets his motto, gets his message from the sort of well-dressed, nice gentleman and gen gentlewoman, whatever, right? And, and sentiments that are thrown out there, you know, on migrants, myths, this, that, that. And believe me, when the EDL's uh, uh, leader went on to BBC, interviewed by Jeremy Paxman, he trashed him on TV. That's fine, because he morally trashed him. He told him, you know, you, you, you're a terrible person. That's fine, everyone agreed with that. But EDL increased in terms of membership, and following weeks and months, the attacks on the streets to migrants actually increased. So, therefore, there is also something to be said while we are fighting racism and anti-immigrant uh, sentiment of, of considering platform issues. When do we give platform to these people? When do we, uh, when do we debate with these people? And under what circumstances? When we don't, right? So that's also important. And, and can I have two more minutes? You, you actually do have two more minutes. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Jeez. Exactly. I'm usually over time. But i just like to finish on a human note. Right? Because everything we do in this world is ultimately centered on the human. And I think us socialists, who better than us, who, you know, in terms of taking the human at the center of our struggle, because it is important that human right. I'm going to write you a little letter from an Irish migrant who's who, from Turkey. Right? An Irish migrant who worked in Turkey, wrote a letter, and says, what is the difference between a worker and a migrant worker? And, well, what they have in common. They both want a better life for themselves and their families. They like to have a comfortable home in a safe environment, maybe some nice neighbors to share a beer with every once in a while. A job where they feel valued for their work, safe working conditions, fair treatment, and enough income to cover the rent, the bills, that occasional beer. They both want to send their children to school with clothes on their bodies, shoes on their feet, and books in their backpacks. They want to be able to say yes when their child asks for some little thing they spotted on a market stall. A little thing that to you or to me, but such a special thing in that child's world. They want to be able to say yes when their child needs five euros to go on a school outing, five dollars or five Turkish lira. They want to live their lives free from oppression, abuse and fear. Neither wants to fall into arrears on their mortgage or have their electricity cut off. Neither wants to lie in a bed every night worrying about the next day, every night, every day. All workers are mothers, fathers, daughters, daughters, sons, sisters, and brothers. All, all, all migrant workers are mothers, fathers, daughters, sisters, sons, and brothers. 
Migrant workers built America, migrant workers built Germany after the World War II, migrant workers designed, erected and polished the bloody Celtic Tiger, who after chewing them, spit them up back onto the streets of Europe and beyond. During an economic crisis, migrant workers are blamed for unemployment, when the reality is that unemployment causes immigration. Workers and migrant workers, we are all just the people who want to live our lives the best way we can and provide the best future possible for our children. When I look down onto the face of my sleeping daughter and the hopes and the dreams I have, I have for her, uh, for her, uh, my belly aches with uncertainty and anxiety. And I know that at the very same moment, there are mothers and fathers in Warsaw, Bucharest, Sarajevo, Beijing, Birmingham, New York, Baghdad, Kabul, and Cork with the same ache. When it comes to feeding our children, it doesn't bloody matter to a worker in what currency she buys the food. Mm.